I just bought way too much. I, I bought it for an event yesterday and there was just, I just didn't need that much for sure. I thought I would need more, but you know, you always plan for more than you need, more than you think. We went to Walmart and bought the biggest bag of half off Easter candy I could find. Probably should have bought the second biggest. <laughs> the second biggest was half that big and cost half as much. Well, it's probably less than half that big, but Lane, can you hear us out there? Lane, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. For a oh. second there, I was wondering what was happening with the sound. I saw you talking, but uh, no, it's good now. All right. My volume's down a little bit too. Let's turn it up. All right, we're ready to go. Uh, let's see here. Okay, well, we are into chapter 11 now. Let's see, how far did we get in chapter 11? Like, I think we are just finished the first section. Maybe not all, all the way, but. So we're talking about magnetic fields. Yeah, we did finish the first section. You guys mm -hmm. missed it. <laughs> the highlights are magnets have two poles at least always poles come in pairs the poles can kind of be analogous to positive negative charges but not really since you have to have a south pole for every north pole in a magnet or in a magnetic field source at least magnetic field lines always exist in loops and connect to themselves connect to each other well connect back to themselves they always form loops um, the north geographic pole of the Earth is actually the south magnetic pole of the Earth, which is why compasses point towards that pole. And some materials are naturally magnetic, and some materials are naturally attracted to magnetic materials. And that's pretty much what we've learned so far. Uh, oh, we also learned... We also learned that uh, electrical charges are affected by magnetic fields if there is something changing in the system, if the, if the charge is moving through the system, if the magnetic field is changing in the system, those are the two things we talked about, or if the magnetic field is moving relative to the charge, that's also. But we also found something really weird about charges that move in magnetic fields, and that is that if the charge is moving in the same, and we're talking about electrical charges here, so. Electrical charges are, are affected or pushed around by magnetic fields when something is changing. But we also learned that electrical charges are, if they're moving in the same direction as the magnetic field, parallel to the magnetic field, they don't get affected at all. But if they're moving in any direction that's not parallel to the field, they are affected. And the way that they're affected is really funky. So mag what, what we've learned so far is that magnetic fields are just really funky. So the funkiness of the movement of an of a magnetic charge or a, a, sorry a electrical charge in a magnetic field is that if the charge is moving one way and you karate chop your hand in the direction of that one way and then you turn your fingers 
in the direction that the mag you ro rotate your hand until you can turn your fingers in the direction the magnetic field is pointing, then your thumb will be pointing in the direction that the charge would be pushed if it's a positive charge. If it's a negative charge, it'll go the other way. So it's a right hand rule thing. Well, we know that when we've dealt with right hand rules before, that means there's a cross product involved and that's definitely the case with magnetic fields. But you can calculate the force exerted on an on a electrical charge by a magnetic field by using a cross product and they give that formula in the previous section, which is section one. Let's go back to that section real quick. So that's the first formula we learn in the in the uh, in the chapter, which is called the Lorentz force law. Here's the right hand rule. The Lorentz force law is right here. Force equals the the electrical charge times the velocity vector of the charge cross product with the magnetic field, the magnetic field and the velocity being vectors. Now, if you can't remember how to do a cross product, then you need to go back to chapter two and relearn that. But uh, essentially, it's a type of multiplication of vectors, and you have it has a specific formula to it. Um, magnetic fields are me magnetic fields are measured in Tesla, named after Nikola Tesla. But we don't often we often use other units because a Tesla of magnetic field is a huge amount of magnetic field. So we often use other measures like. Uh, there are other units that we use that are smaller. Um, I don't remember which ones they talk about. There's a lot of different versions, a lot of different ones. Probably um, doesn't matter. Anyway, we will we will see some other units that you can just convert from. Uh, let's see what else here. So the next, we also learned about how a charge behaves in a magnetic field, in a, in a uniform magnetic field. So if a, if a charge enters a uniform magnetic field that's all pointing in one particular direction with all the same strength, excuse me, then it has a very interesting behavior. And that is that the charge will move in circle in the patterns of circles. And the reason for this is because as the charge comes in, let's say it's coming in from the left here and it enters this field, the right-hand rule, we use the right-hand rule to say this is a positive charge. Right-hand rule says we go ahead and we move to the, we go into the right there and the magnetic field is going into the page. So we rotate our hand till it's going into the page. And then actually this is a negative charge that says right there, it's a negative charge. So, but the right-hand rule tells us it would be an upward charge not a positive charge. This is a negative charge. So it's gonna be a downward one. And so this charge is going to feel a downward force and that's going to turn it downward. But as later on, you know, a moment later, it's now going downward a little bit and we do the right-hand rule again. And the same right-hand rule tells us that it's now going to be pushed backwards. And we do the right-hand rule later and now it's going to be pushed upwards and to the left. And then we do it later and it's upward to the right. And we do it later and it's to the right again or to the, it's to the right. And then eventually it's downward again. And it's just, so all charges when all charges that are moving, uh, if they're moving at a constant velocity and they enter into a uniform magnetic field, they will end up in circular paths. And the circular path is going to be dependent on a few different things. First of all, it's going to be dependent on the magnetic field. A stronger magnetic field will turn the charge more, which means it'll be a tighter circular path. But it also depends on the amount of charge. A bigger charge will make it turn more, which means a smaller path. A weaker field or a weaker charge will make a bigger circular path, a bigger radius of that circle, right? Also, which direction it turns will be determined by the sign of the charge. For this negative charge, we, if it came in from the top, then it turned in a circle below its original path. But if it was a positive charge, it would turn upward and it would create a circle above its original path. So all those things uh, are, are things that matter, but other things that matter also the mass of the particle. If the particle is more massive, it's going to turn less sharply because of inertia. So that means if it has more mass, that increases the size of the circle. If it has less mass, it decreases the size of the circle. Um, also, because it has, if it has more mass, 
and it has more velocity, it will have more momentum, which will make it more difficult to turn as well. Uh, so the velocity plays a factor in there when you consider the mass together with it and so on. So anyway, the point is that it can be a very complex thing going on here, but it can be all worked out mathematically. You can create a map for this, and then you can create a device that uses this to your advantage. How could you, how, how can you imagine that you could use these circular paths to your advantage with particles of different charges and different masses? What could this be used for? You actually can, and those are called particle accelerators. They actually use they actually use magnetic fields, strong magnetic fields, to capture particles in these circular paths, and then they actually manipulate the magnetic field to speed them up. So it'll speed up the particle going faster and faster and faster, and then eventually they just turn off the magnetic field and let it go, and the particle is now coming out of this magnetic field at an extremely high velocity. So yes, those are called cyclotrons. They're invented by a guy named. Ernst Lawrence, Ernst Lawrence? I don't know, he has several laboratories named after him. Um, they were invented back in the 50s when they were doing a lot of atomic experimentation or maybe it was the 30s. But anyway, my brother works at one of those laboratories. What else could this be used for? Something similar, yes, in fact, this is actually, they use magnetic fields, not exactly in this configuration, but in a very much more complex configuration, but they do use magnetic fields to capture or to trap plasmas. So a plasma is, is lots of charged particles, essentially it's like fire, but to contain plasma, you have to use magnetic fields to, to, to control those charged particles. And when you're doing something like uh, fusion, Fusion is the the is what powers stars essentially. It, you create you're building high helium out of hydrogen, and that that creates that's created in a in a huge amount of plasma. And so, if you're going to use fusion to create power on Earth, which we're trying to do, because essentially you can use water to make energy, which is great because we got lots of water on this planet. Um, if you're going to use fusion, you're going to have to contain it. You're going to have to use magnetic fields to contain it. And they do contain it in a loop like this. But it's a it's a much more complex loop. But that's, that is how they do it. They have not yet been able to make energy um, using these loops of plasma using fusion so that it's cheap enough to actually make sense to use it. But they have been able to do it. So, yeah. Any other thoughts? How about different masses making different circles. Could that be useful? Could you use a machine that that made circles of charge that were different sizes depending on their mass and their charge? Let me give you a, let me give you an example of this. When I was working as an electrical engineer, I was in the shop one day building an instrument case or something. I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I uh, I found a piece of metal on the machine. I didn't know what it was. I had a suspicion what it was, but I didn't know what it was. And so I took the metal to one of our engineers and I said, uh, how can I figure out what this is made of? I think it's made of titanium. I want to know what it's made of. I can't find it here. It used to be in this drawer. But anyway, I found this piece of metal. I think it's titanium. I want to know if it is titanium. And he took it to a device that's called a mass spectrometer. And in the mass spectrometer, they actually have a diagram of one here, I think, in this section. Let's see if I'm correct. No, they don't. Maybe in another section. But in a mass spectrometer, you essentially have a magnetic field like this. And it has you put the you put the sample in and it heats up the sample so that it releases some of the atoms from this from the sample. Not many, just a few. Those atoms are put through an accelerator and through a velocity selector that makes all the atoms come into this magnetic field at the same speed. Then, as they come into the magnetic field at the same speed, what's going to happen to the different atoms? Well, you have one atom that's made of titanium. Titanium atoms have a specific mass. And they also, I forgot to tell you that they also charge the atoms. They also, they, they ionize them. So they rip some of the electrons off. But titanium ions have a specific mass and a specific charge. So they're going to have a very specific radius of turn. 
and they just put a screen in there so that when it turns and hits the screen at a specific point, that is where titanium always hits. And then there's another point where gold always hits, and another point where aluminum always hits, and another point where iron always hits. And so whatever material you put in there, you're going to get these points on the screen that tell you what that material is made of, essentially. And the brighter points mean that more particles hit that point, which means there's more of that material. So the brightness of the points tells you the percentages of the material. It's called a mass spectrometer. It tells you what materials are made of, particularly metallic materials. It can do other materials as well, but it does best with metallic materials. So mass spectrometers are very useful tools, and they use this concept. We'll learn more about that later. All right, so here we can actually solve for the radius that different masses make at different charges and different magnetic fields and different velocities. We say that this QVB, which is our equation for calculating the force when the magnetic field is 90 degrees to the velocity, that's the Lorentz force, the magnetic force on the charge. On the left hand, on the right hand side is the centripetal force of the circular path, right? You solve that for R and you get M times V over Q times B. And then you can figure out what all those different radiuses are for the different metals or what or any any charge particle. You can also calculate the period of the motion of it going around the circle, how long it takes to go around the circle by taking the length of that circle or the, the circumference of that circle and dividing it by whatever speed you put the particle in at. And that ends up being two pi times the mass of the particle divided by Q times B. So it turns out it doesn't matter what speed you put it in at. And then, uh, you can talk about the, the different components of the velocity as well. You can also put this thing in, a, uh, in at an angle. If you put a particle in at an angle, it doesn't go through a circular path. It goes through a helical path if the magnetic field is constant. So instead of, instead of going in and just going in circles, it goes in like this spring pattern where it's moving, it's moving along in the direction of the magnetic field as well as following a circular path. And this is actually exactly what happens in the aurora borealis. Okay, so the Earth is like a huge magnet where the south pole of the Earth's magnet is at the north pole, and the north pole of the Earth's magnet is at the south pole. Magnetic field lines always leave the south pole and go around, loop around, and go to the north pole. So this is these blue lines represent the magnetic field of the Earth. Right? When we're in North America, we see, we can detect magnetic field lines from the Earth pointing towards the North Pole because this is where they're going when we're, when we're here out in the middle of the Earth somewhere. When you're at the North Pole, the magnetic field lines do not point north. They point straight down into the ground because they're going into the South Pole of the Earth magnet. When you're on the South Pole, magnetic field lines do not point north or south. They come, they're coming out of the ground and starting their loop around towards the other end of the Earth. So as you're, when you're getting close to the poles, you have all these magnetic field lines that are pointing down towards or away from, or coming out of the ground at North or South Pole. Well, as charged particles come in from space, as particles come in from space and they encounter the atmosphere, they charge particles in the atmosphere and they get charged themselves. And then these particles can sometimes get captured by the atmosphere. And sometimes they're, I mean, captured by the magnetic field of the Earth, rather, in the atmosphere. And as they go around in these loops, it turns out that particles that are charged, that are accelerating, which going around in loops would be accelerating, they glow. Any charged particle that accelerates glows. So if it's going around in little loops around the magnetic field of the Earth, it's going to glow. And these glowing particles look like swirly glowing bands of light that are going down towards the North Pole or the South Pole. We, we usually only talk about the North Pole ones because very few people live near the South Pole. But most, not most, a very large percentage of the, the population of the Earth lives close enough to the North Pole to have experienced this at least at some point. Uh, not a very large, but a large enough a percentage that we definitely hear about it. Um, anyway, the point is, is that if you don't even have to go much further than like South Dakota and you can see that we're about Borealis on really active nights. But that's what it is. It's these charged particles that are accelerating around uh, the magnetic field lines of the Earth and then getting essentially pulled into the Earth 
by along those field lines. Yep. Um, it can affect it. It won't affect it much. Uh, the electric, the magnetic field of the Earth is quite small, and the uh, the electronics and most of the electrical systems that we have are very robust and and not very sensitive to that kind of thing. So power systems and things like that not very sensitive to this. But when you're talking about electronics, more uh, precise electronics like your cell phone and other things like that, they are far more susceptible to those kinds of things. To, to the magnetic field of the earth. Uh, they're just, they're more touchy, you could think of it as. And they are shielded from that. Um, coaxial cable helps to shield from that kind of, those kinds of effects and other things like that. They also have materials that are called, they have materials that block magnetic fields, um, absorb them essentially. We'll learn a little bit more about those in this chapter. Uh, but yeah, it, it can affect sensitive electronics for sure. All right. Here's a beam deflector that turns charged particles. If you if you have a, a beam of charged particles and you want to turn it, then you just run it through a magnetic field. Well, let's imagine that we're, we're we've got these are alpha particles moving through this beam, which means they're positively charged. Which direction does the magnetic field in this blue region need to be pointing in order to turn positive charges to the left? What's the right hand rule say? The right hand rule says that we have to put our hand in the direction of the velocity. So the velocity is going upward. So we put our we karate chop our hand upward. And then we want the force, which is our thumb, to point to the left on a positive charge. So we want the thumb to point to the left. So we rotate it to the left so that the thumb is pointing to the left. And then we turn our fingers and that's the direction the magnetic field has to be, which is into the page. So karate chop into the velocity, rotate your hand until your thumb is pointing the direction you want the charges to be pushed, turn your fingers and that will be the direction of the magnetic field. You want a magnetic field that's pointing into the page on this pipe to turn those charges through that pipe. Otherwise the charges will just run into the pipe and they'll just sit there. They'll just get stuck in this corner. Yeah, and actually go forward versus front left. What? Yeah. I think go forward versus right. Yeah. Exactly. The magnetic field has to point into the page forward, and then the charges will turn to the left. It's weird. It's totally weird. Do we know why? We have no idea. Do we have theories? Yeah. Are they substantiated by experiment? No. We do not know why. But this is the funny thing about this is that this is true of all science. All science is based on things that we don't have any clue why they work. Those, those are called the assumptions or the tenets or the laws of the science. Any scientific law is something that we observe happening in the universe, but we have no explanation for it. That's what we call a law, right? If it's a law, we don't know why it works. We just know that it does. That's it. It's an assumption that we make, and we assume that it works that way all the time in every part of the universe, right? So that's that's what laws are. Laws are never provable. They're never, you, you can confirm that the laws work the way that they do in different situations, but you can't prove why they work or explain why they work, right? We don't know why, for example, forces cause things to accelerate. We just know that they do. Yeah. And this is why I have a problem with people who say, you know, science is about truth. Science tells the truth. No, it doesn't. Science does nothing of the sort. Science takes an assumption that we observe and it explains other things that we observe using an assumption that we have no idea why it works. It has nothing to do with truth. It has to do with making assumptions and extending those assumptions to, assumptions to other things. The assumptions cannot be proven and they're not truths. They're just observations that we assume to be true. They're not true. They're just assumptions. So when people say things like science is true, always, you should always recognize them as people who know nothing about science and should not be believed or even listened to, in my opinion. 
<laughs> There's a great interview that I just saw of uh, some BBC reporter interviewing Elon Musk recently. Elon Musk is a physicist. Okay? His, his degree is in physics, and he understands physics quite well. Uh, it's, it's obvious from his interviews about science that he, is, uh, he understands science very well, the, the fundamentals of science. And this interviewer is talking to Elon Musk about his Twitter purchase and talking about how Twitter has become more racist since, since he purchased it or something like this. He said, it's, it's, it's become more racist. I've noticed more racist things on Twitter. And Elon Musk said, well, tell me one. Give me an example of one racist, one more racist thing on Twitter since I purchased it. And he says, well, well, I, I can't give you an example. I, I haven't been on it in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks, you haven't been on it, but you told me that you have seen more racist things. So give me one example. Well, I've been on it a couple of weeks. That doesn't, that shouldn't make a difference. You said that you understood that you had observed this. So give me an example. And the guy couldn't give him an example because he'd actually never observed it. And because and he's trying to make these assumptions that he that he can just say things without substantiating it with some of some observation, which makes him stupid, literally. That makes you a stupid human being to think that you can say something that you have say that you've seen something that you haven't seen. Well, scientists understand that fundamental flaw in most humans because scientists have explored the idea of, ob of, of observation, right? They understand that you have to observe something before you can say that it exists, that it is. And so he just called this person out on it. And the person and this, this interviewer tried to do this five times with five different things. And Elon Musk said, give me an example every time. He said, tell me your observation. And the interviewer couldn't do it every time. And the only thing that I really got away from, got from that is that this interview probably learned that he should never interview a physicist ever again. And he should stick to his intellectual peers, like politicians and actors, because they're the kind of people who never understand the simple thing like you cannot make a claim about something unless you have observations about it. It's so simple, but so many people cannot wrap their head around it. They just think, oh, well, somebody says that's true. It must be true. Anybody who says they, they know something because somebody told them is an idiot. You either observe it for yourself or don't claim the, don't claim that you know it. Just it's just a common sense thing that is not not very common. <laughs> Unfortunately, common sense is very uncommon. But anyway, so this is something we observe. We have no way to prove it. Anyway, in this particular case, they're going to actually calculate. Uh, some different things. They can calculate the period of the triangle and the circle. They can calculate the radius of the turn. They can calculate all kinds of things. Here they're going to do the helical motion one, where it's kind of the three-dimensional spring kind of motion. They're going to calculate the... All, all of these things are just formulas that are in the book. right? It's, it's not very difficult to do. All right. So now we're going to talk about more some more interesting magnetic field sources because you can get a magnetic field from a from a natural source of magnetism, which usually is a chunk of material that's just magnetic. And we have some we have some ideas on why they're magnetic because there we have discovered that there are certain particles that are magnetic. So for example, neutrons are magnetic, and other particles, pretty much all particles have a magnetic quality to them that can be measured and quantified. And if you have a if you have a material made up of a particular amount of those particles arranged in particular ways, then the, the metal the, or the material becomes a magnet. And then there are other materials that also have some of those qualities, but in different ways. And they are magnetic in that they can be attracted to magnets and they can be turned into magnets. Like iron can be turned into a magnet, but it's not always magnetic. It's not always a magnet, rather. Anyway, we'll get into more of those details. So we've learned about we've learned a lot about those things, um, but there's still a lot of mystery behind it. But anyway, there was uh, there was an experiment done by a guy named Ersted, who was he was doing experiments with electricity, and he happened to have a compass and a mag or a magnet nearby that was uh, that was balanced a balanced magnet. And what he discovered is that when he brings a, brought a compass near to the wire with the electricity going through it. 
the compass wasn't pointing north when it was near this wire that had electricity in it. When he turned off the electricity, the compass went back to pointing north. But then when he turned on the wire, turned on the electricity again, the compass turned away from north again. And he's like, wait a second, why is this wire that has electricity affecting the compass, which deals with magnets? Because at this at this point, this was back in the 17 or 1800s, I can't remember which. Um, it was a while back. And they didn't have any, there was no connection between electricity and magnetism at that time. Nobody had ever thought that these two might be related to each other. And what he discovered is that these wires have a magnetic field going around them in circles. When a current is going through a wire upward like this, it creates circular magnetic fields around it, these inter, these inter um, dispersed um, coaxial circles of magnetic field, you can think of them as, right? And they're strong as you get close to the wire of current and they're weaker as you get further away. And they go around and around and you say, well, where's the North Pole? Of this magnet well this magnetic field doesn't necessarily have a north or a south pole but it does have north south pole behavior it has current has magnetic fields that that form loops like they do through the poles of a magnet so you can't really define the north or south pole but you can see the direction of the field by putting a compass in there so if you put it if you actually if you actually placed a compass near this wire this is what it would look like if i if i put my compass right here and let's say that north is normally this way. And so my, my compass needle would normally point to the right in here. Well, compass needles have the north pole where the arrow is. So uh, the north pole, then this one would be normally pointed this way. And when I turn on this current, what it's going to do is it's gonna, it's gonna flip more this way. The electric current is gonna try to pull it in the direction of the magnetic field right here. The direction of the magnetic field right here is this way. So you're going to have a combination of the magnetic field from the wire and the magnetic field from the earth. The magnetic field from the earth is quite small compared to magnetic fields that we create. And so it's going to turn it mostly in the direction of the magnetic field, which would be into the page. I'm, I'm showing it as up, but it would actually be into the page. Um, but it would be mostly, this, this compass would point mostly into the page if I had this sitting on the table so that this would look, I should redraw this so it looks better. I'm going to redraw this. So I'm actually laying the compass on the table. So instead of it looking circular, it's going to look more like this, right? So it's laying on the table. And the arrow inside the compass was pointing to the right. But now it's going to point. Now afterwards, it's going to point slightly into the, mostly into the page and a little bit to the right, because you're combining the, this magnetic field, which points into the page, and this magnetic field, which points sideways. Combine those two magnetic fields and you get one that's mostly pointing into the page and slightly to the right. And that's what the compass would do. And up here at the top or the, at the bottom of the magnetic field, right in front of us, I guess, this one right in front of us, the mag the, uh, the nor if north was to the right, the magnetic field is also to the right here. So that one wouldn't change at all. But the one that's over here, the magnetic field is pointing down at this point. And so... Uh, the compass that was pointing to the right would be pointing to the right and um, well, the magnetic field's not down, it's out of the page here. But it is, this magnetic pointer would be pointing to the right and out of the page at this point and so on. And, yeah, and you know, you can actually map your magnetic field around wires using compasses if you want to. In fact, I think I gave you a couple of compasses in your in your electrical kits so that you can do that if you'd like to try it. So there's a right-hand rule for this. So the right-hand rule for this is if the current, so here, everybody take your right hand. This current is, this wire is going upward in the page. We're gonna put our thumb in the direction of the current and the, the magnetic field will wrap around the wire like our hand wraps around the wire. So in this particular case, the magnetic field in front of the wire is going from left to right. In back of the wire is going from right to left. And on the side, on the left side, it's coming out of the page. On the right side, it's going into the page. And that's the right-hand rule for current. Well, this is interesting because we've now used a right-hand rule to determine the force that magnetic fields have on a charge that is moving. Well, current is charge that's moving, isn't it? 
current moving this way is the same as positive charges moving this way in the wire. And a right-hand rule just determined the magnetic field from charges moving. You say, well, if moving charges are affected by magnetic field and current, which is moving charges, creates a magnetic field, maybe that's the reason that charges are pushed around by magnetic fields when they're moving. Because when moving charges create a magnetic field, they become magnets. And if magnets are in magnetic fields, they definitely are affected by magnetic fields. So maybe moving charges, when they create their magnetic fields, become magnets? Well, that's a really good thought, because what we're really learning here is that electricity and magnetism are forever intertwined. They, can, they are not different things. They're actually different observations of the same thing. There's no denying that from what we understand about electricity and magnetism. Just these two experiments demonstrate that electricity and magnetism will always be intertwined because there's no such thing as, to th as something that's not moving. Everything in the universe is always moving relative to something else. At some point, it's, there's just always movement going on. So in the universe, electricity and magnetism cannot really be considered separate things since one of them causes the other in this case. In this case, moving electron, moving electricity or changing electricity causes magnetic fields, creates magnetic fields. So that's interesting, and it's going to get more interesting as we learn more. And we'll find out that they're even more intertwined than that. So the magnetic force on this current is going to be the same as the magnetic force that we would calculate on charges moving in a magnetic field, except now our charge is going to be continuous amount of charge moving, um, which is funny because it's a continuous amount of discrete charges, so it's not really continuous, but anyway. Uh, we're going to consider the current now instead of a single charge. Well, a current can be defined in terms of a single charge. Current is essentially equal to a bunch of uh, charges that have the charge of the, the, the quantized charge of an electron. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That's E right here. And the number of those charges that are moving in the current is the N. And they're moving through a particular cross-sectional area, A, that's the wire. And then they're moving at a particular speed, which is the drift velocity of the electrons, V. And that's, our, that's essentially our current. If we want to break that down into how much charge that is, we just take out the E. So the E tells us how much charge there is. And that can be pulled out of the equation so that E times the velocity, the drift velocity, crossed with the magnetic field gives us the force on one of those charges. And then if we multiply it by the number of charges and we multiply it by the cross-sectional area, and then we multiply it along the length of the charge or some, some infinitesimal piece of the length, dl, and then we, then we will get the total force on that piece of length of the, of the current. Well, of course, whenever you start doing different derivatives, then you can start to do uh, you can start to do um, integrals and put it all back together again. In this particular case, they first put it back together again after they've separated these derivatives, and they find they they uh, separate the velocity into a direction derivative that goes in the same direction as the current, of course. So the current direction is the dl vector, and then we just have dl crossed with b and all this other stuff out in front. We've removed the E from the, from the velocity and the E combined here and replaced that with DL. And now we have the current. The NEAVD is just the current again. So now we can calculate the force on a piece of wire that has a current I going in it. And this is going to be the force, essentially the force uh, per unit length because of this derivative we've done. When we add this all together, it's going to be the force per unit length. But we, we have now the current and the cross product between which direction the wire is pointing or which direction the current is going crossed with the magnetic field. That becomes a fairly simple formula. So cross product I cross B or I L cross B after we do the integral and putting it all back together is going to give us another right-hand rule. If a wire is in a magnetic field, 
and we want to know what direction it's going to feel a force on it. You stick your hand in the direction of the current, you chop, you karate chop the direction of the current, you rotate your hand until you can turn your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and then your thumb will point in the direction that the force, the magnetic field force on that wire. So in this particular situation here, we have a current that's created by this battery here, and this battery is gonna create a current going counterclockwise. So it's going on the top wire, it's going to the left, on the side wire, it's going down, the left side wire, the bottom wire, it's going to the right, and on the right side wire, it's going up. That's the direction of our current. And we can actually draw that out really quick just so we can see it. Direction of our current is going this way, okay? What is the force on this wire gonna be on all the sides? Well, on the top one, the current's going across, so we karate chop to the left. Do it with me, come on. And then we're gonna rotate our fingers until we can turn our fingers into the page, which is the direction of the magnetic field. So into the page. So which direction is the force on this current at the top? It's downward. So we have a downward force we're gonna label right here. That's the force on the top wire. Now we go down the side. The current is going downward here. Karate chop downward. Rotate your hand until you can turn your fingers into the magnetic field this way. So the force on this one is to the side. This is the force on the right side. Now we go on the bottom wire. The bottom wire, the current is going to the right. We rotate our hand. We turn our fingers into the magnetic field. Our thumb is pointing up. So the force is pointing up here in this magnetic field. And then the current is going upward on the right side. This should be left side, not right side. Force is going upward on the, on the right side. We karate chop upward. We rotate our hand until we can turn in our fingers into the magnetic field. The force is going to be to the left on the right side of the wire. So what is gonna to happen to this wire, this wire with current in it, in this magnetic field? Is it gonna feel any net force? Remember, this is force per unit length. So the length of the wires doesn't matter. Is this going to affect this loop at all? If it has a force, if it has all these forces on it. What's the free body diagram of this loop look like? Here's the loop and there's an upward force. There's a downward force. There's a sideways force and there's an opposing sideways force. And all these forces are essentially equal for every individual piece of the current. So is this going to affect this loop? No. In fact, it turns out it doesn't even matter what the shape of the loop is. If the magnetic field is going through the loop and the loop is, is perpendicular to the field, the surface of the loop is perpendicular to the field and the loop is all in one, is all in one, uh, is, is all in one plane, then the loop won't be affected by the field at all. However, that is not true if we consider this, if we think that this loop is hanging. If this loop is hanging, then there's an additional force in here, which is the gravitational force. And there's also two tension forces upward. So we have to consider those things as well. Now, if those things balance out, which they do in this case, then we're good. However, <laughs> this is not true if we turn the loop or we turn the field. Let's say that the field is now pointing this way. This is our magnetic field pointing to the right, to the left rather. Right? Let's do our let's do all of our uh, let's do all of our right hand rule things again. Okay, so the right hand rule says we put our hand in the direction of the current. We'll do the top first. Hand in the direction of the current is to the right, and then we rotate our hand until our fingers can turn in the magnetic field. Can they turn into the magnetic field at all? No, because this current is in the same direction as the magnetic field. So what's the force on the top? If you turn the fingers then the force on the top is zero, right? Remember the cross product between two vectors pointing in the same direction is always zero or pointing in opposite direction. So since the current and the magnetic field are pointing in the same direction, the cross product between them will be zero. So the force on this top one is zero. From the, from just from that, we can actually say that the force on the bottom one will be zero too, right? Because the current is going opposite the magnetic field there. But what's the force on this one? So we on, on this on this side here, we have the current going down. 
So we karate chop our hand down, and then we rotate our hand until the magnetic field, until we can turn our, hand, our fingers to the left. And that means it's into the page. This one right here, this side is gonna feel a force that is into the page. That's the force on the left side. On the right side, the current is going up, karate chop up, turn your fingers. The magnetic field is gonna create a force coming out of the page here. So what's gonna to happen to this loop now that the magnetic field is pointing to the left? It's gonna push in on one side of the loop and out on the other side of the loop. What's that gonna to do to the loop? It's gonna rotate it, it's gonna twist it, right? Well, that's useful. Hey, can, you think of a, can you think of a situation where you have current running through a loop in a magnetic field and you cause the loop to twist? Anybody seen something like this before? This is the rotor of a motor from a vacuum cleaner, okay? This is the thing that rotates in a vacuum cleaner that causes the veins to turn, that sucks up all the stuff into your vacuum cleaner. Look what it's made of, loops of metal. And they put this in a magnetic field and then they run current through these loops of metal. And that current causes these things to turn. It causes them to rotate, to turn, to twist in the field, which causes the motor to turn. So creating a motor that turns uses this concept. Put a loop of current in a field and have the current um, create that twisting motion. Now, of course, once you've twisted the wires in the field, it's gonna line up with the field and then it's gonna stop. So you have to have many loops and we're gonna talk about that more later. But you can get, you can certainly get forces on wires in magnetic fields and on loops of wires in magnetic fields when you put currents through them. That's good because you can turn the current and, and you can turn the current in a loop off. And if you can turn the current off, you can turn off the force. So now we have a way of creating force by flipping a switch and, or flipping, off a, flipping a switch on or off. You can create force or turn off force. That's a very useful thing. We use that all the time in our everyday lives. Here they do an example of calculating those forces, but it's not terribly difficult. It's just formulas again. This time you're using this formula instead of the uh, other one with the charge and the velocity, you're using current and magnetic field and stuff like that. So lots of different examples, but they're all the same. This last example shows that the shape of, they, they do this for, the sh for a circular shape, and then they do it for a general shape, and it turns out that it doesn't matter what the shape is. If the loop is in, is in a single plane and the magnetic field is pointing in whatever direction, the force, all the force carries about, it cares about in the end, it turns out, is the area of the loop. And that's quite interesting. It doesn't care about the shape of the loop at all. It just cares about how much current, how much um, magnetic flux, field flux goes through the loop. And next time we're going to talk about how we can build a motor and use these things to our advantage. So we'll be back on Friday. We should be able to finish this chapter on Friday and be uh, caught up again. We'll see you then. Get started on good your homework. You can ask questions on Friday, too. All right. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Oh. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs>